God chose to communicate to the nations of the world, primarily through one nation. In this episode of The Prophetic Connection, find out how the words of the Hebrew prophets revolutionized their world and continue to impact our world today. I'm in Israel, the land of the prophets. Over my shoulder, a statue depicting Elijah, one of the great prophets of Israel. But what is a prophet? A prophet is one who speaks for God in the present, but also can prophesy future events when God chooses to speak through that prophet. The Apostle Peter spoke and described prophecy in this way in 2 Peter. And so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. This is an allusion to the coming of the Messiah of Israel. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. What's amazing today is that though the Hebrew prophets spoke to the nation of Israel in their own time, their words, because they are actually God's words spoken through them, are timeless. And their words have applications today, even in the 21st century. Israel, the land and people, have always been the primary bridge between heaven and earth. The Bible tells us that God chose this one nation to have a unique relationship with Him and to communicate His prophetic messages to the world. Israel was created divinely to teach the world God's ways, to be a light to the nations, and ultimately, bring salvation to planet Earth. Yet Israel has not always been an exemplary nation. In fact, the Bible records how time and time again, the nation of Israel forgot her special covenant with God, sinned, and even worshiped the idols of other nations. It was especially during these times that God would raise up prophets in Israel, individuals who had a uniquely close relationship with God and who were specifically gifted by him to communicate heaven's message to Israel and the world. Uh, I would say that we can understand that, that uh, in Jewish tradition that a prophet is an individual, very much human, who takes the, 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 the almost universal human, not just Jewish, but also Jewish capacity to communicate with God, to have a relationship with the Lord, uh, and has taken that to an, an additional level because of a gift that they've been given by God in terms of a, a direct form of communication, sometimes direct, sometimes through dreams, sometimes through interpretations. Well, prophets in ancient Israel were people who were chosen by God to be his spokesman, and God would give them a special revelation and a voice uh, to, the, to the nation. And they were important because because you had the, the political setup with the kings and the, and the prophets were kind of a counterbalance to that and God would speak directly to his prophets and you have those wonderful, wonderful men of God who were given tremendous revelation. Israel needed prophets. So there were godly people, some were men, some were women, that heard from God and brought the word of God to the people. For instance, here we are on Mount Carmel. Elijah was the prophet that God found that he could speak the truth to and Elijah would have the courage to confront the government, the king, what was happening in, in, in the land. Elijah, one of Israel's greatest prophets, lived at a time when Israel was under the evil leadership of King Ahab and Jezebel, who led Israel to worship Baal, a Canaanite god. Because God had instructed Israel to worship him alone, he sent the prophet Elijah 
to challenge the 450 prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. The prophets of Baal erected an altar and called upon Baal. Elijah prepared an altar according to God's instructions and called upon the God of Israel. The God who supernaturally ignited the altar would prove to be the one true God. A prophet is a man who has a word that's not his own. It came from God. When Elijah came up here on this mountain and brought all the false prophets up here, he, he, he prays this simple prayer. Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, he said, let it be known that you are God in Israel and that I have done all these things at your word. The wood that he put on the altar, the 12 stones which represent the 12 tribes, everything he did was prophetic. The victim, the blood, the water, it all pointed to the cross, of course. And he said, I've done all these things. That, people said, how did he know the fire was gonna fall? Because he said, Lord, I've done all these. Th the Lord told him, I've done all these things at your word. So hear me, Lord, hear me, that this people may know. And a prophet's heart is always to see, have the people's heart, that their hearts are turning back to you, turning the, it's not just judgment, it's turning the people, having a broken heart for the people. That's why Jeremiah was the weeping prophet, that all these people went on. And the Lord responded because the Lord had told him, and look what happened. They all fell on their face and started crying, the Lord he is God, the Lord he is God. While the prophets of Israel often came with a stern message, warning Israel that if they did not change their ways, God would judge them, their primary purpose was to encourage people to turn back to God and His holy ways. I think there's a simplistic notion of prophecy, as if prophecy is some sort of clairvoyance, forecasting of the future. That is part of the prophetic tradition, and some of our prophets uh, were obviously talking about visions of the future, but most of them weren't. Most of them were talking about very down-to-earth concepts of morality. I believe the prophet is important because it brings back the immediacy of God's Word. And it cuts through. Otherwise, we'd be stuck with a religious hierarchy and we'd be stuck with, with uh, more of a, the, the political um, power relationships in, in human relationships. And that, that dominates the world uh, outside of the body of Messiah, outside of the body of Christ. But prophets really bring back the immediacy where God takes uh, his authority and his prerogative to speak directly to his people. The prophets came with a message that applied to each immediate situation Israel faced, a message that cut through religious hierarchy and spoke directly to the hearts of individuals. Yet sometimes Israel's prophets saw beyond the present and their prophetic words either warned of impending disaster or brought comfort and the promise of a peaceful, glorious future. Yet one thing is for certain. Israel's prophets carried messages from heaven, messages from a timeless realm, and because of this, their words have an everlasting nature. They transcend time and space, applying not only to ancient Israel, but also to modern Israel and every heart throughout history. Prophets of Israel, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Micha, uh, and, and the others have had a tremendous influence, not just on the development of Christianity and an understanding of, uh, of, of a messianic age uh, that, that is anticipated, but, but in the fundamental concepts of righteousness, of compassion, of morality. Uh, I mean, you look at the, the United Nations, no great friend of the Jewish people, as an institution, let alone as uh, in terms of the makeup of the United Nations, many, many nations who are absolutely explicitly and even uh, 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 vocally not uh, real fans of the Jewish people or certainly the Jewish state. Um, and yet in the entrance to the United Nations building is a quote from Isaiah, a quote which expresses a universalistic but nevertheless very Jewish goal and, and concept and dream of a world without violence and without war. Uh, you have quotes from Isaiah and from other prophets that, that permeate uh, Western philosophy, whether it's uh, uh, the Declaration of Independence in, in the United Nations, the idea of the Liberty Bell. Where does that concept come, that fr come from that freedom will, will ring throughout the land? Guess what? That's from the Bible. The concept of freedom, of individual liberty, comes from the prophetic visions of true justice and liberty and morality. The words of Israel's prophets as recorded in the Bible have dramatically impacted our world. But most important of all, they saw into the future 
to a day when the Prince of Peace would come to earth. His coming would initiate a new prophetic age, a time when heaven's prophetic words would be written on the hearts of all who believe in his name. Although Israel failed God again and again by violating his commandments and his covenants, God was patient with Israel. Why? God loved Israel. His relationship was based on love, but also he had made promises to Israel, promises that he would keep even if Israel failed to keep her side of the covenants. There were prophets in the land, raised up by God, men and women who would call Israel back to the ways of the Lord. And even though they stoned the prophets and killed those that God sent to them, still God kept raising up prophets and prophetesses who would call Israel back to the ways of the Lord and urge Israel to keep the covenants that she'd entered into with the Lord her God. But there were also false prophets in the land. Hear the warning that comes on the lips of Moses in Deuteronomy in chapter 18 in verse 9. And this precedes Israel entering the promised land, the land promised to them. And Moses says to them in verse 9, When you come into the land which the Lord your God has given you, you shall not learn to follow the abominations of those nations. There shall not be found among you anyone who makes his son or his daughter pass through the fire, or one who practices witchcraft, or a soothsayer, or one who interprets omens, or a sorcerer, and it goes on from there. Because these were the Canaanite practices, and Israel going into the land of Canaan would have very quickly been contaminated by these idolatrous practices which were forbidden to the sons of God, Israel. And then Moses continues in verse 20 of Deuteronomy 18, But the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or who speaks in the name of other gods, that prophet shall die. And if you say in your heart, How shall we know the word which the Lord has not spoken? When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the thing does not happen or come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. You shall not be afraid of him. And again in chapter 13 of Deuteronomy, Moses makes this a very clear. If there arises among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, and he gives you a sign or a wonder. You see, false prophets, some of them had the ability to do signs almost like we would speak of a magician today and astonish the people and influence the people, but always, always away from their true God. And so Moses is warning Israel, even if you see signs, marvelous signs, do not follow them if they lead you away from God. And he says in verse 2, And the sign of the wonder comes to pass, of which he spoke to you, saying, Let us go after other gods. And there's the test. If they say, Let's go after other gods, then they are clearly false prophets. Let us go after other gods which you have not known, and let us serve them. You shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God is testing you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. You shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice. You shall serve him and hold fast to him. But that prophet or, or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death because he has spoken in order to turn you away from the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of bondage to entice you from the way in which the Lord your God commanded you to walk. So you shall put away the evil from your midst. There can be no contamination in the camp of Israel. God is a jealous God. And so he warns Israel again and again of the consequences of their sin, but still he doesn't cast them off forever because of the promises he made to them and the love that he has for them. And then we find in the book of Jeremiah, the calling of one particular prophet, which helps us to understand what a prophet of Israel was and what his task really was as well. So here are the words of the prophet Jeremiah, his own writing, his own confession, beginning in chapter one in verse four. Then the word of the Lord came to me saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Ponder the depth of truth 
in that statement. Before you were formed in your mother's womb, I knew you. And that's true for Jeremiah, it's true for each one of us. But there's more. Before you were born, I sanctified you, I ordained you a prophet to the nations. You and I are born in purpose, for God's purpose, but what is that purpose? And if we go through our whole life and we miss God's purpose, how, how sad that would be and what a tragedy it would be if in life we have missed God and what, what He wants of us. Then said I, Ah, Lord God, but I cannot speak, for I am a youth. Now we have feeling of inadequacy, which is really a qualification for serving God in the first place. Because it is not in our abilities and our strength, it is in our availability and God's anointing and strength that we serve Him. But the Lord said to me, Do not say, I am a youth, for you shall go to all to whom I send you. A prophet is called and sent. And whatever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of their faces, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, Behold, I put my words in your mouth. See, I have this day set you over nations and over the kingdoms to root out and to pull down, to destroy and to throw down, to build and to plant. Prophetic authority bestowed by God on those who serve him. Now, there's some very important things in, in this short passage that we need to see about prophets called to speak to Israel, to call Israel back. First of all, they must be called of the Lord and then sent. God sends them. They have to be anointed. And God touched Jeremiah's lips and said, it won't be your words that you speak. It'll be the words that I put in your mouth. You, those words you will speak. And the prophecies have to come true. If a prophet predicts something and it doesn't come to pass, then he's a false prophet. Moses said that so clearly to Israel when they said, how shall we know a true prophet from a false prophet? Moses said, the thing that they prophesy will come to pass. And if not, they have spoken presumptuously, if you like, even falsely. And always the prophets of Israel were sent to call Israel back to the ways of the Lord. So anyone who calls himself or herself a prophet that is leading Israel away from God is therefore a false prophet. Now, Jeremiah is known as well as the weeping prophet. He prophesied the destruction of Jerusalem, which occurred at the hands of King Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonian armies. They came and destroyed Jerusalem. They obliterated that first temple that Solomon had built. And Jeremiah sat down and wept because he was weeping with a broken heart. If you like, God's heart was broken as well. And the holy city should have been devastated like that. In fact, he wrote the book of Lamentations. He lamented that the people would not listen to his prophesying. And so the destruction came, the consequence of their disobedience, rebellion, and sin. And he lamented that. But even having done that, he prophesied that they would only be in Babylon, the captives that is, taken away from Israel. They'd only be there 70 years because with prophetic insight, he saw their return. So here's what he says in verse eight of Jeremiah, Chapter 29, for thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let your prophets and your diviners who are in your midst deceive you, nor listen to your dreams, which you cause to be dreamed, for they prophesy falsely to you in my name. I have not sent them, says the Lord. And then Jeremiah gives his prophecy. For thus says the Lord, after 70 years are completed at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you and cause you to return to this place, meaning the promised land. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. This is God speaking to Israel in her dispersion, in her brokenness. They, when they arrived in Babylon, they hung their harps on the tree because they said, how, how shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? We're separated from the land of Israel we have not got the heart to sing the songs of Israel. Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. That applies to us as well. I will be found of you, says the Lord, and I will bring you back from your captivity 
I will gather you from all the nations and from all the places where I have driven you, says the Lord, and I will bring you to the place from which I cause you to be carried away captive. So Jeremiah prophesies that for 70 years only, Israel will be captive in Babylon, but she'll come back. And history teaches she did come back and she rebuilt the temple that was destroyed and repossessed the land. Now, later still, she was dispersed again, but those promises of the regathering stand today and today Israel is still coming back to this land. Well, the prophetic phase of Israel's history was coming to a close because after the Babylonian exile, there are only three other prophets that we know of that speak truth to Israel for God. And one was Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. Those three in order finish off the Old Testament period. And so Malachi is the last prophet to speak for God to Israel. And then there are approximately 400 years of prophetic silence. And no word comes and no prophet is raised up. But then suddenly, a voice is heard crying in the wilderness. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. A voice crying in the wilderness. And with those words, a new prophetic age dawned for Israel. Stay tuned for more from Dr. John Tweedy after this break. We have seen that heaven communicated with earth through the Hebrew prophets and through them to Israel and the nations. But by the end of the Old Testament period, ending with the book of Malachi, yet another prophet, there is a period of about 400 years of silence when heaven and earth do not seem to be in communication. But the prophets had said a new prophetic day would dawn. We read in the prophet Isaiah in chapter 40, Comfort, yes, comfort my people, says your God. Speak comfort to Jerusalem and cry out to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, for she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. Then this verse, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. I'm standing in the place called Bethabara, behind me the river Jordan. I'm actually standing in Israel, but over my shoulder, just beyond the water, the kingdom of Jordan. This traditionally is the place of John the Baptist. Here, John, who can be called the last of the Old Testament prophets, or if you like, a bridge between the Old and New Testaments, he preached here, called people to repentance here, and to have their sins washed away, sim symbolized by being baptized in the water. But John's time came to an end, and he was imprisoned actually in a fortress in Jordan. And he sent disciples to Jesus to ask him, are you really the one who was to come? Or should we be looking for someone else? And as they departed, Jesus had said to them, tell John what you've seen and heard. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the deaf are healed. In other words, the miracles attest to who I am as Israel's Messiah. And then as these emissaries from John left, in Matthew 11 and verse 7, as they departed, Jesus began to say to the multitudes concerning John, What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? But what did you go out to see? A man clothed in soft garments? Indeed, those who wear soft clothing are in king's houses. But what did you go out to see? A prophet. Yes, I say to you, and more than a prophet, for this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. So Jesus makes the prophetic connection between what Isaiah said in Isaiah 40 and the ministry of John the Baptist. And because Jesus had come, John said, now I must diminish and he must increase. But you know what? With those words, a new prophetic age was already dawning. Here are the words of the writer of Hebrews in the first chapter, beginning at verse 1. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom he made the worlds. 